outcome. So as Lewis has already mentioned and has been uh, presented before by Petteri, I'm going to talk about the once-only principle in Europe and want to give you a bit of an outside perspective on what's going on outside extra, but also going to try to put it into uh, a relationship from a European context. I myself am coordinating the Once Only Principle project that's coming to an end uh, by the beginning of next year. And yesterday we just took a bit of an, a key of what we have accomplished and I want to give you a bit of an insight into that and an overview. Recently in the State of the Union address by Ursula von der Leyen, she really clearly put the Once Only Principle and the European integration when it comes to a digital single market to the agenda. She has said that the next decade should be Europe's digital decade, where it's actually about using data and using data wisely. And that is not something that's only come up today, right? Or that's a, a, a finding of the past years. No, it's actually something that has been around since we are talking about electronic government. So one of the key papers in the area, you know, obviously being a researcher, we're always going to our research papers, is a prediction by Lane and Lee back in the year 2001 when they said, like, how is e-government going to develop? And they basically developed a stage model, basically an ideal development process over time. And what they said is, you know, you're going to start out with cataloging services information and providing it to your citizens. You're then going to start to offer transaction services like your tax return or registering your home address or similar things. And that's actually where most countries are at today. So they're offering transaction services. But it actually is more than that. It is actually about tearing down the silos, tearing down the silos that are available in different policy domains, which on the one side can be still done through vertical integration so that you go dif uh, through different levels of administration, but essentially only when you're going to do a horizontal integration that a data exchange layer for a country is providing, such as XROAD or other national solutions that we'll be talking about in a bit, then you're actually able to really use the benefits of data in e-government and actually providing holistic services to your citizens. So implementing the once only principle is essentially having a technical infrastructure that legally and policy-wise is enabled to exchange data between different sectors, between different services, and essentially being at the benefit of the citizen. So you want to have enabled automatic data sharing. You want to replace redundant data collection with actual information requests, essentially going from copying documents to linking to the original source, which will lead us to better data reliability. So what do you need for that? You need to be able to collect only the necessary information and having access to existing information. So that requires you to somehow have a process when you're developing your e-government services that you're checking. So which is the data that you produ produce anew? Who is going to be in charge? And where do you get the existing data already? So you want to have this idea that you never have to ask for the same data all over. So like I have currently, I'm Austrian citizen, so I recently uh, added a new member to my family with the birth of my son, and I had to register them with the authorities back home. And for that, I still have my folder with all the paper documents that I need to refer to, put in numbers, put in dates. Essentially, the idea of the cross-border once-only principle is that I will not have to do that, that I can provide evidence from one country to the other. And that's what we tried out in this large-scale pilot, the once-only principle project that we started in January 2017 and that's going to run until January next year. We had 23 beneficiaries from 23 different countries, both inside the European Union and also outside, to also enable us to really have a European approach. We have more than 50 partners involved, half of them public administrations, one-third universities and the rest companies. We had a budget of 8 million euros. So what did we achieve, as Lewis said before, we piloted it in three domains, on one side around e-procurement, around business mobility, and in the maritime domain, in order us to enable having time savings for public administrations and businesses, to lower the administrative burden and cost, and to improve the service quality and public sector efficiency. 
of course, and that is really this element in particular when it comes from a German-speaking country like myself, this Datenangst, yeah, this fear of having data available and that predicting what you're going to do next and that you have no control over that. So you need to be compliant to data protection legislation, which should put the citizen and the data owner in control. And that is also implemented with the one's only principal project. So we want to have security, interoperability, data quality, and user friendliness essentially to provide a better functioning digital single market. So when we look at the overall ones only uh, legislation, strategies, and infrastructure, then we can see that we have three countries which you see in complete blue here. They actually have national legislation that mandates the ones only principle, but they don't have what is green, the national infrastructure for the ones only principle, right? And you also have vice versa. You have countries that already have the data infrastructure for exchanging data like Sweden or Latvia that do not have a legislation for that matter. But actually, there are countries like Estonia, like Slovenia, uh, like France that have both. They have an exchange layer and they have the legislation that allows them to do so. And really, that is what you want to have. So what we see in our experience from the One's Only Principle project, TOP, is that legislation is really one of the main barriers and drivers at the same time. And here comes in the European level. In our project, we started in January 2017. For those of you that were aware about the European schedule, that was just half a year before Estonia had its presidency. And during the Estonian presidency, the single digital gateway regulation was proposed by the European Union and then passed uh, a year later that essentially mandates if you have a list of 21 services available digitally in your country, then you have to offer it also to people from abroad in the European Union. So with that, our project moved really from, you know, a nice to have to very high up in the agenda and essentially also made it so necessary that countries with existing data exchange infrastructures will be able to connect to the European data exchange solutions, which was mentioned already before, are based maybe on other technological ways, such as e-delivery, which is going to be the main protocol used on the European level. And I will also come a little bit about that, why that has happened. So to summarize, 22 of 30 countries that we looked at have a national legislation in place for ones only. There is a wide range of regulations, sometimes that prohibit the requesting and storing of data. That is something that really needs to be going forward and that we need to overcome. And that's the big challenge to bring once only on the agenda much wider. We can see that once only with this attention to policy is really part of a global plan for public services and something that people believe is a driver for the digitization. So 18 out of 30 countries highlight OOP in their digitization strategies. It's also mentioned the Tallinn Declaration that was passed in uh, fall of 2017 that also includes a whole chapter around ones only with the aim to reduce administrative burden both on the side of public administration and of uh, the citizens and businesses. Five countries have not highlighted probably yet ones only in any of their strategy documents and we didn't get data from seven countries in our study. Maybe let me also mention here that I want to thank my colleagues from ILIM uh, Shimo Mamrod and Kasia uh, Mishinske to, uh, for her work around this study. So the infrastructure for OP is in place in 22 out of 30 countries. It takes very different uh, ways of how this technology is in place. Some of them provide access to base registries. Some of them are really data exchange systems and platforms. And some of them provide a central bus system like the XROAD, for example. So let me come to an end. So the single digital gateway regulation will facilitate online access to information, administrative procedures, and assistance services across the European Union. It will provide a new drive for the ones only principle for the data exchange within countries and also across countries. The portal Your Europe will really give more access and new access to information on the European level, and TOP and its results will contribute to that on the long run and have been kind of like a blueprint of how this, will go, how this is going to happen. We will ensure the results of TOP to be sustained by on the one side licensing to them to the European Union, on the other hand, have an organization, the ones only org organization that will also further sustain our results. 
E-delivery might sound like a competing technology, but in reality, it's complementing national solutions such as X-Road and actually will allow us to bring Europe together without having to mandate countries to fully switch to one technology. In a sense, I think we have a truly European project by bringing once only to the citizens and businesses of Europe. With that, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your interesting questions. All right, now, uh, it's nice to see you again. Yesterday, and in face, uh, face to face. Yeah. Face to face. Yesterday, yeah. uh, the top project had their online webinar. Uh, it was a European-wide thing. It was completely online, and I had the privilege of hosting that as well. So uh, I've already had a very good education already from uh, your whole team, and they did a great job of explaining this. So, uh, I mean, because uh, the people who are using X-Road, they're typically coming maybe more from an X-Road perspective. They're coming more from a technology perspective. And you're really way up there. You're way up at a policy, way up at a very high European level that you're setting this. And I think it could be easy for, for some of the, the X-Road people to think like, ah, oh, this is some policy fluff. These are some guys in Brussels waving their hands around. Um, how do you see this? Do you see these ideas disseminating at a very high level, at a policy level? I mean, we get it. We're the technical yep. people. We know what's up with X-Road. We know how to communicate. But how do you see it all the way up there? Let's put it that way. I mean, we had our insights very early on that somehow ones only is very high up in the agenda. I mean, basically, we had an intern that was uh, interning with uh, the former uh, Vice President of the European Union in charge of the digital single market, Andros Ansip, actually having in his office three top-level agendas, and one of them was clearly ones only. We were at the beginning a bit surprised, but then only later really realized what transformation potential this really has, because essentially it means who is in charge of which data. And that is not only on a national level, but also on a European level, really, truly important and necessary. That's tricky. Now, who's in charge of that data? I mean, it, there is some, and okay, it does make a little bit of sense, I guess, that it was Mr. Ansip from Estonia who was pushing some of those ideas forward uh, as well. I mean, I would say this perception, of course, helped that you know Estonia is a front runner in terms of adopting technology and bringing them also into public service, and then having that as a commissioner in charge of this certainly that prepared the grounds and set the agenda. But in reality, really, the member states recognized what does it mean for us? What does it mean for them in the sense of what can we, what benefits can we ripe, and what can we take of that? And that is in the sense of some five billion euros every year if once only would be used across the European Union. Hmm. Right, used across the European Union, which is a big thing. So we're kind of talking here a little bit more, I mean, yeah, this is policy level stuff. This is, I don't know if this is the correct term, philosophical level stuff. It's high level ideas about how we should be running ourselves. Let's go back a little bit to the our last talk with Petri about E-Road versus E, sorry, X-Road versus E-Delivery. Mm. Now, as much as I have understood about TORP, it's, uh, it's not a technical solution as such. It's policy level no, Stop. it's both. It's, it's actually both. Okay. really hardcore technology okay. of really showing what could be the technological solution for the single digital gateway Article 14 system, mm. right? And that is based on e-delivery. And why is that, right? The main thing about Europe is countries don't like to be told by Brussels what they have to do within their country borders. Yeah. What they do like, please define the interface, right? And that's exactly what the top project focused on. It focused on defining the interface between countries and making sure that whatever the country is using inside for exchanging data, for integrating data, is fine for Brussels. But once you leave the country borders, well, you need to be able to talk to your neighbor. And that's where exactly e-delivery comes in. It allows a federated approach to data exchange for saying one country A, country B, how can they talk to each other? And that's what top built. Right, and that's where if a country has an X-Road system, yeah. this is where Petri was talking about, cool, our X-Road can connect into that system. Estonia or Finland will have their own X-Road to e-delivery gateway, and that's how they would get external access to this greater European system. Exactly, and what we also saw in our piloting, because we actually tried out to implement that technology uh, in our organizations that were part of the project, but also on the national infrastructure level, those countries that actually had this data exchange layer, this technology in place, whatever it was, 
were so much quicker yeah. in actually implementing the solutions. I mean, basically down to one person month of development time, which is basically nothing, right? Sure. That makes sense. And I think what that can also do is uh, buffer states and in the member states from the, they, yeah, the whims of the union that, oh, we change this. No, no, you can do whatever you want internally. It's okay. Do whatever you want. Just present us this interface because yeah. policy takes a while. And I think that could help member states if they have some hesitation about making this. It's like, cool, just make something that works for you first. Have, of course, have some thought to the interface, but you're just going to have to bolt on this interface later. I mean, it sounds a bit easy, of course, but essentially it is. And that's what's going on now, last year, this year, what the member states are really actively working on. I mean, there's basically a daily meeting working on exactly this interface, how to make that data space also work mm. so that by the end of 2023, I mean, that's only three years from now, yeah. this is actually possible, right? Mm. You made a comment yesterday that has stuck in my mind. I think it was you, I'm not entirely sure, but that was that policies and at the high level often lag behind. So it's the more tip stereotypical situation. Ah, uh, the, the bureaucrats take forever to catch up. We've got all these hip people here who are working who are way ahead of the game on X Road and, and all of that. And you go, well, Brussels, geez, they're, geez they're, they're far behind. But then it tends to happen that all of a sudden, bam, policy catches up and laws catch up, and then that then become, policy then turns into the fire that actually drives these things forward. It's almost like a supercharger that kicks yeah. in all of a sudden. Yeah. So, I mean, it's clearly laws are acting kind of like as a catechon. So basically making sure that only the right things really get implemented and actually getting used that are beneficial for society. And once they are, right, then law can change. And that's exactly what the crisis also told us, right? The crisis is, a possibility to change course, to adapt and to develop. And once you do that, once you make that decision, such as the single digit gateway regulation, then it really requires everyone to fall into line and let's run and let's implement this. And that's, that's exactly what has happened on the European level. Hmm. Let's talk about one of the examples we went through yesterday was the Norwegian maritime example, that ships, they're coming into Norway, they got to get inspected. And before it was a lengthy process, I mean, we all know the paper isn't bad, but you're talking about ships. You're going to have to you're going to fly someone out to a ship. I heard something yesterday, like they had to f just fly someone out to a ship just to deliver a document. I was like, what? That, yeah. it seems like an incredible amount of inefficiency, but that happens. Talk us through that case study of the Norwegian maritime example. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially the whole logistics area, the transport area is very much paper-based. So, I mean, mm. maybe it's more transparent if we use the airplane, right? So... When you see the door shutting of a plane, just before someone comes in and hands some piece of paper yeah. to the pilot, right? Yeah. And that's exactly the documents for what is being loaded on the plane, who is, who is the crew, and who are the passengers of that plane. And it's exactly the same thing for a ship, just that the numbers of passengers is usually much higher, and the numbers of freight is also much bigger. But essentially still there is a paper document yeah. that you put on the vessel, and once the vessel approaches a port, it has to produce those documents again. Right? And the idea that we had in our project was, let's try out what if we can actually pull all the information that are in those documents from base registries and actually then reproduce them and provide them when entering the port. And that was what we, what we went for. And of course, also assuming that in Europe, we actually have one policy domain where we can mandate that. But it turned out that actually the, the maritime area is much wider. I mean, yeah. you know, you can go with a ship anywhere in the world. The world yeah. So essentially the ships are registered anywhere in the world. Mm. The crew is coming from anywhere in the world. So it became really a world project. So in a sense, uh, it was something that learned us a lot and challenged our infrastructure quite a bit and allowed us to further develop it and make it even more robust. Right. And what I found interesting about that case example was that you may need to pull some data from, okay, the ship is registered, I don't know, let's say in Estonia, okay. So you've got to talk to Norwegian authority, needs to talk to Estonian authority to find out about the individual ship. But then according to once only principle, if you've got a seaman from Germany and one from Finland, and you, you then have to be talking to the individual countries to find out Captain Finland, Captain Jussi from Finland, okay, we got to pull his data from the Finnish registry, pull from the German registry. So there's quite a lot of individual connections there as well. And you clearly see why in the old days people thought about documents, right? Because yeah. they collect all the information in one piece at this place. When you're going towards a linking system, 
you actually need to have access to all the different systems. And that's what makes it so difficult when you go bilateral, right? Mm. Meaning the so-called spaghetti model that you connect from your system to all the other systems. So much rather having this uh, lasagna approach, right? As we named it actually in the event that you were also moderating, it seems like Lewis is the real ones only champion. But coming back to the lasagna model, it basically means you're connecting to this one system, to the one data exchange layer mm. that allows you to connect all the others, and that's what helps you integrate, right? So, because when you go spaghetti, I mean, forget about it, the exponential numbers, I mean, they kill you. Absolutely, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Right, and so that, Lasagna model might be with the e-delivery. That's what e-delivery was trying uh, to solve. Extra, similarly, right? Okay, I yeah, mean, sure. data exchange layers in general, right? Right. So the only big difference between Xroad and and, and e-delivery is e-delivery is perfectly suited for federated architectures, where you basically need to have different architectural levels, different administrations, that maybe agree or do not agree, and you can set different. Uh, decisions. You can also implement that with Xero, don't get me wrong, but you basically have to have everyone using the same technology, which with e-delivery is not necessary because you can work with gateways. Right, sure, sure, sure. And I guess when we're talking, spaghetti is bad, uh, individual connections are bad, but yes. we don't want to, uh, it depends on what's your individual connection. What I'm trying to say is that maybe we don't, if we're trying to find Captain Yussi from Finland's information, we don't have to connect to the Finnish Maritime Authority directly, but instead we're going through the Finnish gateway that in then internally is connecting. And that's not a spaghetti, that's a reasonable solution. I mean, we're basically going towards the network economy, right? The bigger the network, the more useful it is for me, the more it is worth. It's the same, but like with your mobile phone contract back in the days when they offered very small rates for calling other friends that are in the same network. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. So that's yeah. the same principle behind that. And so network economics is what drives essentially data exchange layers. Okay, this makes sense. Uh, now, we had an interesting question here, which I'll to take us in a different direction. We've talked about that example. Uh, let's t how does TORP, and I'll explain a little bit more, how does TORP, uh, with the principle of keeping our data in one place and making sure that it has access, we want to keep it in one place. Now, we want to provide access to that, but we also want to ensure all, to, all of the data security and data protection. And, there's a little thing, I don't know if you've heard about it yet, it's called the GDPR. I don't know, it just came in. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Now, how, how are we meshing this with GDPR? Is this, it seems like it's gonna be a minefield of, to not only get access to that information, but then ensure that the citizen still has ownership control of that. Is it a technical solution? Is it a policy solution? Give us that overview. So basically, it's a combination of okay. both, right? So GDPR has been really influential when it came to data protection, not only within Europe, but really worldwide. And it all bases still on the same principles. You can basically mandate the exchange of data with two ways. Either you're going to mandate it on a legal way, meaning you pass a law that allows you to exchange the data, or you get the consent of the individual to exchange that information. And what we have now in the single digit gateway regulation is that in any case, the citizen needs to agree that your data can be exchanged, right? Maybe some cases will allow us to do that on, on, a, on, a, lawful, on, on, a, on a legal basis for a law, but that needs to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis. But the, the preset way is having a consent from the individual. The second one is before the data is being used, you want to see what the data looks like. So a so-called preview function is included in there. So, and of course, this policy decision had to be implemented in the technical system, and that's exactly what the top principle did, or the top project did. We have both the consent of the individual, yes, I agree to use this data in the other system, and before it is going to be used, I'm gonna see what the data looks like, and then I agree, yes, please use it. So you actually have full control over the data. But of course, uh, the important thing is what happens with the data once it leaves it. So basically, you can always withdraw that consent, and that's also an important principle that we've implemented. Okay, I mean, my, again, back to our maritime example, the information comes from the Finnish Maritime Authority, and then the Norwegians have to, I don't know, be trusted with it or something, I guess, and to not keep that, not replicate that, not use that in different ways. And that's another important challenge, right? Yeah. So you need to build the trust within this network that any participant in there is trustworthy, mm -hmm. right? And that's something which we already had in the EIDIS regulation, which provides us with access to identity documents from another country, 
right? There are also different trust levels that allow you to do different things. And that is something that is currently being developed in the Implementing Act for the single digit gateway regulation. That how will this trust look like and mm. what things will we actually develop around that? But that's going to be key and that's one of the key questions that public administrations have. Good. All right, Dr. Krimer, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much.